What's going on everyone? In this video, I want to talk about using Nessus Vulnerability Scanner. If you're looking to become a security consultant, you need to know that using Nessus is gonna be a fairly big part of your job, especially when you are doing things like external or internal infrastructure assessments. It's by no means all of your job. You should definitely be doing some manual testing as well, but automated vulnerability testing is gonna be something you need to do. Um, and in this video, I just wanna show you a few of my tips and how I configure Nessus to get a thorough assessment out of it, essentially. So if you don't know what vulnerability scanning is with Nessus, Basically, you give it some IP addresses, it goes and looks for any services that are available on those IP addresses, uh, or it can log into maybe Linux or Windows to find any misconfigurations in the operating system or missing patches, um, and looks for any vulnerabilities within that, basically. Um, so, when you log into Nessus, this is what you will first see. This is the dashboard. Uh, you can do two things to start a Nessus scan. You can either go new scan and use some predefined um, policies or you can create your own policy which you could use across many different clients if you're doing the similar type of thing which you probably will be so we're gonna make a policy I'm just gonna talk you through some of the things that I set up um, that I can use across all of my clients so as I said there's many predefined policies here if you want to do a web application test you can use that one for example but for this assessment we're gonna go and advanced scan and set a load of different configurations up manually so new advanced scan, you can name it whatever you want. I'm just going to go example. Um, and the first thing you want to look at is discovery. So this is an important setting straight away, ping the remote host, turn it off. And the reason you want to turn that off is because if you leave it on and any IP addresses that you give don't respond to ping ICMP, then you might miss ports that are actually open. So turn it off and it will do a thorough port scan and find all of the open ports. Fragile devices, you can leave that off because you don't want to be scanning network printers and operational technology devices because that could lead to denial of service and a very unhappy client with you. Wake on LAN, don't need to worry about that either usually. So the ports, this is another important selection or configuration. It starts with default. These are set in, I think, etc. services within Linux. Um, or you can use all, which is the full TCP port range. Um, but in my case, I set it like this. So you can go T colon one hyphen six by five three five, and that's scanning the full TCP uh, port range. Or I also add on a U for UDP and add one to 1024. You don't wanna be scanning all of the UDP ports because to be honest, it's gonna take ages to scan all that. And you've gotta manage your time on client sites. So scan all of the TCP ranges, it's pretty quick. Scan some common UDP ports to get a good kind of feel of the vulnerabilities within the network. It's thorough enough, basically. Local port enumerators. So this is the thing that actually logs into Windows or Linux or whatever device you've got this set to, um, to look for the misconfigurations with a credentialed scan. So you can leave this as normal. That's absolutely fine. Network port scanners. Turn on UDP so it will actually look for those UDP ports that we've set. Using a SYN scanner is fine. You can use TCP and that will do a full three-way TCP handshake, but it takes a lot longer. And to be honest, using a SYN port scan is good enough in this case. So just use a skin, SYN scan and probably half your scanning time. Let's go to service discovery next. You wanna probe all ports to find the services and you wanna put this to all ports. The reason you wanna do that is because sometimes clients will have um, TLS services running on non-default ports and if you don't have all ports, they won't be found. So that's not a thorough assessment. So have that to all ports. Next up, let's use the assessment tab and you want to put on perform thorough tests. Unless you're using quite a congested network, you definitely want to tick that just to be thorough. Um, you can also, if you want, add a definition grace period. So if you know your antivirus definitions are uploaded um, every seven days or something, you can set that to seven days if you want to. I generally just leave that as normal. Next up, brute forcing. Only use credentials provided by the user, leave that ticked, and we set that within credentials, which I'll talk about in a minute. Everything else, leave the same. You don't want to brute force the Hydra and you don't want to brute force Oracle databases. And the reason you don't want to do that usually is because you'll probably end up locking accounts out within the client domain. And again, you'll have a very unhappy client. So unless brute forcing is in scope and they want it, don't bother doing it. And even if they do want to do it, you probably don't want to use Nessus for that. Just go ahead and use Hydra yourself because you know there's, some, there's more flexibility using the command line Hydra. SCADA. 
Don't need to worry about that unless you're doing a Scala job, which is not typical. Web applications, on an infrastructure assessment, it's doubtful that you'll be looking at web applications, but if it is in scope to scan web applications, you can turn that on and you can enable the generic, generic web application tests with all of the methods here and thoroughly test it so don't stop after the first floor is found. That's a fine configuration to scan web applications, but in general, you don't need to scan web applications unless it's in the scope, so I'll turn that off for now. Windows, kind of fine as it is. If you want a bit more information about the domain, you can turn that on, which I will do. Malware, we're not looking for malware. We're not trying to do some forensic analysis here, so leave that off. Report, this is a very important one that I think a lot of people get wrong when they first start using Nessus. You want to turn this off. Because the reason is, if you have this ticked and you scan a Linux or Linux Windows machine or Linux machine, you might have a load of patches that are missing on that machine and that's going to show you all of those patches. When in actual fact, usually with things like Windows, there will be one top level patch from like now that will actually patch all of those other patches that are missing. So you don't want to be providing a client with 50 different patches that are missing you want to provide them with the one patch that will fix those 50 patches. So turn that off, basically. And then allow you to edit scan results just so you can play around with them if you need to. And if you want to, you can tick this. So basically what that does is instead of looking at vulnerabilities per IP address, it will show you vulnerabilities per host name. And the clients tend to use host names around their estate rather than IP addresses. So this could be useful to you and to the client. But, you know, if DNS isn't set up appropriately or right, that could mess things up. So I typically leave that unticked. And if they do want IP addresses and host names, you can have a look at that later on and provide them a, an Excel spreadsheet or something like that of IP addresses to host names. Next up, advanced. Don't really have to change anything here other than performance settings. If you know you're going to be on a congested network, you've asked your client if kind of the network's pretty flat, you might want to turn on performance options. You might want to put the simultaneous host to something like 30 or less. It's going to take a long time to scan, don't get me wrong, but it's better than dosing the client network and then being unhappy with you. So kind of think about that before you start the scan. You know, I've been in cases where I have not ticked this and the network's pumped very slow, especially when you're trying to scan over Wi-Fi and things like that, which I would never recommend, but sometimes you do just have to do that um, because it's the way it is. And now we have a good policy to start with. If you're doing an external infrastructure assessment, that would be fine to go ahead and just start scanning with. If you're doing an internal infrastructure assessment, you probably want to actually log into the host that you're scanning, and you can do that using SNMP, SSH, or Windows. So if you're scanning a Linux host, you obviously want to go SSH, and you can use public key authentication, or more commonly, you'll be given a root user that can um, well, not, maybe not a root user, maybe a pseudo user, but an administrative user basically on Linux. And you'll put the username and password in here, you'll put the pseudo username and password in there, and then you can go ahead and scan Linux. With Windows, very similar. You have a local admin or a domain admin. You can put the username and password in there along with the client's domain, and you wanna tick these and these. So sometimes if you don't tick these and not already enabled, Nessus won't scan everything with privileges and you know, you won't get all of the vulnerabilities, you might miss something. So that's not a good place to be. And for these top two, keep them enabled because you don't want to be sending credentials in the clear and you don't want to be sending them using old authentication mechanisms because it's vulnerable. So once that's all set up, you can then go ahead and do uh, internal infrastructure assessment. What you might also want to consider is compliance. So there's various different um, compliance bodies that kind of set the best practice security options on Windows, Linux, and various other devices. So you can go ahead and pick whatever you want here. So you might want to pick the, uh, if you're scanning a Cisco firewall, maybe you want to check the Cisco firewall compliance um, guide here versus the configurations on the device that you're scanning. And that will tell you kind of what doesn't match up with the CIS benchmarks, for example. Then you can tell your client, you know, this isn't meeting best practice. You need to change your setting to this and gives you a bit more to talk about in your report. I tend to not use this, but it's something to consider. So with this all created now, we can go ahead and save it. And now we can use this across various clients. And to do that, you can go new scan, user defined and your policy here. 
And then you have the option to put in your IP addresses. So uh, I'll just put in my IP address, for example, here. Um, and then you might wanna, if you're doing this uh, on your own estate, set up a schedule. So you can enable a schedule to scan daily, weekly, monthly, yearly, if you want to, and that's gonna give you vulnerability analysis kind of on an ongoing basis. So that's something to consider as well. But if you're doing this kind of client to client, you don't really need to worry about that. You can just put your IP address in, click save, and go ahead and scan. I'm not gonna do that in this instance because I'm not gonna scan myself, but what I am gonna do is talk about an example report that I've done previously here for the purposes of this video. So as you can see, this is what a report looks like. It gives you loads of different critical, high risk, medium risk issues. Um, one thing you definitely need to know about Nessus is that it really over eggs um, the risk rating here. So there's a lot of criticals here that aren't really criticals. You know, I would rate something as a critical risk if it's exploitable and you're able to really do some damage to a network potentially. Um, there's a lot of things here that don't even have a public exploit and it would be pretty hard for, you know, your average Joe to go ahead and exploit. So not really a critical in my book, but nevertheless, their vulnerabilities and they should be patched. So you do have things like Adobe Flash Player. So that's a third party uh, software that needs to be patched. Um, you've got unsupported Windows operating systems, so things like Server 2008, for example, that, that kind of alerts you that that needs to be upgraded to a, a a new Windows version, not an old one. More third-party software issues, um, and you've got things like this, which is a Microsoft patch. Um, web servers that are outdated, basically just various different vulnerabilities that might be able to be exploited that the client needs to know about to either patch, which is usually the main thing, but there's also misconfigurations like registry key settings that aren't changed, um, as well as various other things. You know, this, this is really good because it gives you the um, installed version and what the supported versions are to fix this. So you could give that to a client and they could fix it. My biggest tip here, though, if you're trying to actually do some exploitation, is filter the results. Go to Metasploit, Exploit Framework is equal to true, apply that. And these are all of the different things that have a module within Metasploit. So if we go to Adobe Flash Player here, we can see that it actually has a Metasploit module here to exploit this version of Flash Player. So if you do a bit of social engineering with this exploit, and get the exe file onto um, the IP addresses that are vulnerable and someone clicks on it, you would be able to gain access to this machine. But yeah, I think that's kind of what I wanted to show you today. That's how to set up a Nessus scan for thorough testing and kind of what the example output is of it. Hope you learned something here, guys. Happy hacking. Thanks for watching. Give us a like and a subscribe. Yeah.